For a number of years, I've been tracking a curious finding in my research. Men remember less than women from their personal autobiographical memories. They remember less about what people were thinking, what they were feeling, they remember less detail. They even self-report on questionnaires, their memory to be a little bit more fuzzy than those of women. And it's not clear exactly why. My theory is that men tend to discuss fewer details about themselves and about their thoughts and about others in conversation, and that over time, this tendency actually leads them into remembering less. Let me begin with an example from a participant in one of my studies describing what we call a self-defining memory. The participant writes, my freshman year when I went back home for Thanksgiving break, I was having a conversation with my mom about having kids in the future. While on the topic of having kids, I told my mom that one day I'd be interested in adopting children. She suddenly seemed very confused and asked, why would you want to adopt kids if you could have your own? I ignored her and walked to the bathroom to wash my hands. She followed me to the bathroom and asked again, but I don't understand. Why would you adopt children when you could have your own? <clears throat> I walked out of the bathroom and I said, because I'm bisexual, mom. She stared at me for a while in confusion and I walked upstairs to my room. I read this narrative and I was floored. I, this is clearly an emotional, a painful, a difficult narrative. And in the narrative, there's nothing there. There's no, no pain, no difficulty, no emotion. And not surprisingly, this was written by a male participant. Now, we have possible explanations why this might be. Maybe he was rushing, he was on his way to class or something of that sort. Maybe he had told the story too many times. Maybe he thought I'd read it in front of a large audience. But I think we can all agree that this person was probably feeling more than he was writing. There's a lot more there than what he's sharing in the narrative. And so my theory is that we have norms about how men and women talk about their memories, and that over time, these norms turned into norms about how men and women should talk about their memories. And so, men share less and become worse at remembering over time. We adopt conversation styles in connection to gender, but these styles lead us into ignoring information that we don't plan on sharing, and that we eventually lose access to. Let's begin with a model of what memory is, consider some findings, and then look at the implications for consciousness itself. For a long time, we've looked at memory as something that is associative. Memory is not stored in one particular spot in the brain that we go and access when we remember something. It's distributed in patterns of brain activity. And when you remember something, the patterns of brain activity that were active when it happened, those are being reactivated. In this sense, it's distributed throughout the brain and therefore not easy to distinguish between one thing and another. And so thinking about something brings to mind similar concepts. We associate based on similar patterns of activation. This is why unique information is often needed to get exactly what memory you're looking for, what we call a cue. If you go back to an old neighborhood you used to live in, memories from that time period come flooding back to mind. We associate based on color, we, thinking of something red, gets us to think of something else red. We associate based on sound. We make slips of the tongue with similar sounding words. We even associate based on our experiences and conversation. You tell me about something that happened to you, and I tell you about something similar that happened to me. And so, through this spreading activation, we associate one event with another. Let's return to gender and memory and think about how we can use this. There are books and ideas out there that like to stress strong differences between men and women. Men are from Mars, and women are from Venus. Men are independent, women are interdependent. Men want to fix a problem, and women just want you to listen. My wife tells me that she's having trouble with her computer. I've learned to say, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> Let's make this kind of claim about gender and memory. Let's make a strong claim. Women remember with more emotion, with more interpersonal detail than men do. How would such a difference, if it were true, come to exist? It's not so simple as being in our genes. There's a lot of variation on this. It's not strictly about men and women, and it's not about every man and every woman. And so how does this difference in gender come to exist? A number of researchers in my field focus on memory as a learned process. This might seem counterintuitive. We think of memory as something that we do naturally. It just happens to us. But really, we get social feedback on our memories, and that teaches us how to recall. When you tell a story, if you're going on and on and telling it a bit too long, somebody says, hey, get to the point. If you leave out a piece of information, people start to ask you about that information, and you learn to include that next time. So through social feedback, we may, we may have that innate ability to, rem to remember, but social feedback teaches us what exactly and how exactly to remember. 
Since the 1980s, a group of researchers have been examining mothers and their children in conversation about memory. These researchers bring in, uh, especially mothers, but parents with their kids, kids aged two to six, and the parents elicit memories of events from the children, and the children tell narratives of their memories. And researchers have divided mothers into two groups, elaborative mothers and repetitive mothers, based on the types of questions they ask to their children. Repetitive mothers try to elicit information. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, oh really, what else happened? These are elicitation questions, but they don't add content. The elaborative mothers ask what, where, when details, and often include some of their own details. There was a park next to the beach, wasn't there? What happened after we saw the helicopter? Who else was there with Aunt Sally? These are all questions that elicit information, but also add information into the conversation. Researchers have examined adolescents, age 12, age 13, based on the way their mothers spoke to them when they were three and four years old, and have found that the children of elaborative mothers have memories from an earlier point in their life than the children of repetitive mothers. Stop and think about this for a second. The way your mother spoke to you when you were three years old has been found in empirical research to predict the date of your memory 10 years later. Now, we know that parents elaborate more with their daughters from research as well. And parents aren't the only influence. Children have distinct styles of playing based on gender. Boys play in larger groups, girls play in smaller pairs or groups. Girls receive more questions, not just from parents, but from other people about their emotions, about their personal experience. They get engaged more in conversation. And this opens the door to gender differences in memory, to a potential developmental mechanism. Since it's so dependent on social interaction, though, we need a way to measure what we mean by gender, because it's not as simple as what you self-identify on a questionnaire. So in my work, we've been using a scale that does a pretty good job predicting how well men and women report events in their lives. This is the scale. It's got eight terms, kind, gentle, helpful, warm, emotional, understanding, aware of feelings, devoting of self. And this scale, uh, people just self-identify. They rate on a scale from one to nine how much this uh, term describes you. Is this a lot like me? Is this nothing like me? And these traits do a very good job capturing a pretty common stereotype of women being more interpersonally oriented and emotionally expressive than men. Now, looking at data from participants in my study, I've managed to section off groups of individuals. And specifically, I want you to focus on this navy blue line at the bottom, which is a group of men who score low on this trait. Uh, on these eight traits put together, not all men do it, but some men score pretty low on these traits in comparison to the rest of the population. And what we have here on the y-axis is their self-report ratings of a questionnaire that combines different measures of uh, memory, accessibility, vividness, amount of detail. And what we're seeing is that across a number of different types of events, these men are self-reporting their own memories as being more poorly recalled than women. What does this mean? People who emphasize these particular traits pay more attention to interpersonal and emotional details, put more emphasis on them in their lives. And what I'm going to argue then is that the emphasis on those details strengthens memory not just for those details, but for other aspects. If memory is associative, if memory is about creating different pathways, then the people who focus on these details have created more or more diverse pathways to access their own memories. Now, you might be thinking, well, I feel certain things in my memory, but I don't necessarily talk about them. That doesn't mean I'm not going to remember them. And that might be true, and it starts as a style of conversation rather than an ability. But over time, by not talking about those things, by not sharing those details, you eventually put less energy into actually remembering those details and come out with a memory that has fewer pathways for recall. If we go back to the coming out story that I began with, I'm not suggesting this person's gonna ever forget this event, but he is making fewer connections, fewer opportunities for connections between this event and other related events. So to summarize, gender predicts these particular traits of being emotional and interpersonally oriented. These traits then correlate to memory recall. So how is it that men and women come to remember differently? Social norms teach us to remember differently. They lead us to different emphases in our lives, in our interpersonal lives, and in our memory conversations. And over time, this leaves many men with less access to specific memories and to details about their memories over time. What I want to turn to now is the question of whether these effects are not only evident in memory, but in how we think as well, in our conscious experience. 
Philosophers have long been concerned with what's called the problem of qualia. What does it feel like to experience our brains? What is it like to be inside of our heads? We know that the brain processes information. We also know that we have this inner mental experience, this sense of what it's like to be me. We, what we don't have is a very good linking of those two processes. We don't know, we don't have a little me somewhere inside of me that's interpreting my brain processes. And for a long time, philosophers, psychologists, neuroscientists have considered this problem untouchable. It's not scientific, it's too vague, it's wide open. Recently, a scholar by the name of Giulio Tononi has argued that we can come up with a model to consider this problem. He says that we need to stop thinking of the brain as causing inner experience, but instead that brain processes are inner experiences. We need to think of a model that unifies across these different domains because they're actually not different domains, they're different ways of looking at the same information. To do this, let's imagine a conscious space in which every piece of information contributes. So if I want to understand what it's like to be you, I need a measurement of every single process that's going on inside of you, and if I could map that space in some kind of format and understand what the mapping meant, I would have some kind of representation, maybe a mathematical representation of what it is like to be inside your head. Let's use a really simplified example with a frog. Let's use a highly simplified frog. It's really only interested in three things. Is it cool? Is it wet? And is there a fly anywhere in the vicinity? So the frog's consciousness with respect to these three domains can be mapped in three-dimensional space at some point in these three dimensions, and I would know where the frog is on these dimensions based on mapping these three variables. Let's consider our associative memory model. Let's say I have a memory, and I can remember when it happened, I can remember what I saw, what I was feeling, what I was thinking, I can remember who was there, and I can even remember the other memories that it's triggering. In this sense, I could talk about this memory as existing in a six-dimensional space. I could talk about it existing as values on six different measures. And if I had a memory, a similar memory, that didn't have any visual detail, I don't remember what anything looked like, then that memory, we would say, is existing in a five-dimensional space. According to this model, first of all, no two experiences no experiences of two different individuals are ever gonna be exactly the same because we're making different associations. We've got a different infrastructure there interpreting the information. And so when I see something red, when I look at this red carpet and you look at this red carpet, even if both of us are seeing exactly the same color red, I'm making different associations than you. You're thinking of your high school football team and I'm thinking of cherries and licorice. So we associate differently, but not only that, if we are systematically activating different types of information, if women are systematically activating more information about their thoughts and their emotions than men are, then maybe you and I are actually having fundamentally different conscious experiences that can be systematized on a group level based on our social identities. To the extent that men and women differ in their memories, we may be having qualitatively different conscious worlds. And if you think about this, this is a brain-based way of describing the diversity that we know exists in the world. This is a model that recognizes the uniqueness of the individual and the influence of the group without belittling either. We've got real patterns of behavior that we know exist in the world, and on top of that, we're individuals who negotiate ourselves with the patterns of the groups that define us. And how we become an individual, how I become an individual is how I navigate my inner experience with the experience that I've had based on my group, whether that's based on gender or something else. For me, being a man entails what I have been exposed to as a man and how I have grappled with that exposure. If I am in a given scenario, I can recognize I have this tendency, this tendency to remember, this tendency to act a certain way, and it may be linked to my gender experience, and now, as an individual, I make a choice as to whether I want to embrace that or if I want to go against that. It's not limited to gender. To be gay, to be straight, to be of a racial identity, of an ethnic identity, none of these confine us to who we are as people, but they do entail exposure to some kind of shared environment. That's what makes us a group. And that leads to patterns of information that are available to us as that group. 
Once I understand that nothing is true of me because I'm a man, but that my experience of manhood will contribute to how I think, I can take my gender experience and turn it into a part of me without confining myself to a given destiny. I can think about how that gender difference is influencing me in my life and make my decisions about whether I'm going to take that on or whether I'm going to walk away from that. Gender differences in memory are real. They exist in the way our brains process information, but that's as much a product of our experiences as of the fact of our genetic makeup. Recognizing that fact opens us to new ways of thinking about diversity, about gender, and about memory, and these can help us appreciate the vast potential both in what is in our brains that we don't yet understand, and in terms of how these differences can be minimized or celebrated, expressed and navigated in our interpersonal worlds. Thank you.